I'm very interested in, in your reactions and people's experiences, but I'd like to locate it for you. Um, this is a practice we use in the fourth session of, of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And there's a way in which what we try to do in the program is to help people work on um, a couple of things in the program overall. If you, if you ask people who have been through this program or people who have had depression, what they take out of the program, there are two things that they say. These are like their sort of take home messages. One of them is depression is not me. And two, thoughts are not facts. But at the same time, we know that psychologically when people feel depressed, depression has a way of attacking the self changing how we view ourselves and hold ourselves in a way that makes it seem perfectly okay to feel inadequate, hopeless, worthless, helpless. And also that the thoughts that arise when people are depressed can be very sticky. They can really seem as if they're facts. And so we know that mindfulness meditation does all kinds of different things. But in, in our program, and specifically in this practice, there is a lot going on. But we're trying to help people work with mental contents, especially thoughts and emotional thoughts, thoughts that have an emotional charge, in a way that suggests that there is a movement to all mental phenomena, whether they're sensations in the body, whether they're sounds that are arriving at the ear, or whether they're thoughts that come into our minds. We have the capacity to watch and observe them just as we would with thoughts, just, sorry, just as we would with sounds and just as we would with sensations. The ability to develop this observational stance or this um, capacity of awareness of movement of thoughts allows us to help them be seen as less static and fixed and true and gives us a little bit of distance to perhaps respond differently than if we just take them at face value and go ahead and act. And so that's why there's this kind of modular buildup in this practice of first settling the body through attending to sensations of sitting, sensations of breathing, and then inviting that observational capacity to be deployed to sensations in the body, to sound, and to thought. That most of us feel that there's something special about thinking, special about our thinking ability. Um, and here the suggestion is really thoughts are another form of sensation that we can observe and hold in a larger spaciousness and watch their movements. Now, you know, not everyone gets that and different people get different benefits from the practice. Even in the chat, I was seeing different um, reactions, which is, which is all good. Some people enjoy just the settling and, and uh, some of the, the compassionate guidance, the invitational way in which people are asked if they're willing to do certain things. And if not, that that's okay. But I just wanted to put that out there because there is a way in which this practice has been put together. And I think it tries to address the capacity that um, people who are dealing with, with a lot of difficult thoughts can sometimes use to help them get a little bit unstuck. So if there are any questions that people would like to address, um, I can scroll through and see. If there are some, so I've got a question from Vasu about MBCT being very effective for unipolar depression. Can you please describe if it's effective with bipolar? There must be some studies. Um, yes, there are some studies, um, but with bipolar depression, the introduction of mindfulness is very different. So um, here, the introduction of mindfulness practices come first through sitting practices, and then we add on more movement-based practices 
in bipolar depression, the protocols that I've seen um, start with movement practices, start with addressing the possibility of people gaining and building awareness through movement. And I think that that addresses the restlessness of the minds of people with bipolar disorder. Um, and also the physical restlessness that that disorder can sometimes induce. And so um, it seems to me like that sort of modification makes a lot of sense. Thoughts are another form of sensation is a wild idea. This will stick with me for a while. Um, guess what? There's a lot of really good brain science that actually starts to support that idea too. So if we start to think about what we're doing in the practice of mindfulness, and I think the practice of any type of meditative practice, and, and I would even broaden that to talk about any type of contemplative practice. A lot of what we're doing is training ourselves to engage in interoceptive awareness. We're training ourselves to develop the capacity to read internal signals in our body. Now, when you're meditating or you're doing a body scan or you're doing yoga, um, it's, it's pretty obvious, you know, that's where you're focusing your attention. But there are a lot of other contemplative practices like, you know, lighting candles, um, worry beads, other ways in which we're invited to step out of our heads and into a realm of sensation, even for a brief moment. And when you look at what that does in the brain, there is this reciprocal linking of networks in the front of the brain, the midline cortical parts of the brain that are involved with thinking and planning and self-reference. And the uh, back parts of the brain a little bit more to the side, not in the middle, that are involved with processing sensation. Now, the way the brain works is if one part's very active, it takes a lot of energy from other parts of the brain, which become a little bit less active. And so when we're thinking and planning and thinking about ourselves a lot, the front and middle parts of the brain are very active and the sensory parts of the brain are not very active. But if you um, look at what happens with people who have been trained in mindfulness, when they are in a scanner, an fMRI scanner, and they're feeling sad or they have an emotion that they can re recognize, they are better able to activate sensory regions, which then very naturally turn down the activation in frontal regions. So there is a um, way in which the thinking part of the brain naturally quiets as our attention moves to focusing on sensation, whether that's sensation in our bodies or whether that's sensation in a physical space that we're exploring. For example, when you're in a large forest and you're walking, there's so many ways in which sensation calls to us and our attention that paying attention and directing our awareness to those sensory cues naturally settles the thinking mind. And there's a lot of really good research that shows people increase um, on a number of mood and cognitive memory functions just by engaging in activities that are sensorially quite rich. So this notion of a reciprocal relationship between thinking and sensation is one that's, I would say, only recently coming into its own, but I would think within the next five years, you're going to see a lot of research on um, interoceptive, um, the science of interoception, the science of training ourselves to become good at really foraging for sensations. Does anyone have a question that they want to ask me? You can maybe uh, raise your hand. Also, Although there are a lot of people I here. Questions that came up at 651 and 652 from Sarah and Holly. There's a couple of questions there. 
Okay, are they in chat or, or are these folks uh, going to ask the questions yeah, themselves? And I see that uh, Peter has raised his hand also. Okay, okay. so how do I find Peter uh, in uh, 512 top, people? He should be at the top of the screen. Oh, got it, Peter. Okay, so Peter. Um, Ask him to unmute. Yeah, here I am. Peter. Here you go. Hello. Your... <clears throat> I want to thank you for your calm voice, your state of voice, and just the somatic level on which you're communicating to us. Um, here's my question. <clears throat> for some reason, maybe a disability or something, my neurotransmitters are often very depleted and being able to focus is uh, very difficult mind wandering and all that and something i notice about practice is it starts with a thought because you you're using words to talk to us so we're taking in your instructions conceptually through thought and then we're translating that into an internal behavior of attention toward sensation. So it starts, the thought actually leads into the sensation, at least my experience. And often what happens for me is there's just some sort of exhaustion response that I have to, to having to do anything, to discipline myself or say to bring my mind back to the breath over and over. And sometimes what will happen is someone will say a phrase during the day. Someone a couple of days to me, a couple of days ago said to me, what if it were easy? And so it made me look into my life, into my experience for ease and just my sense of the universe around me. And um, I, I was able to just let go of a lot of sense of burden. And the what I used when I was meditating, when you were leading us, what I used was I just used that little inquiry thought over and over. And what would happen is spontaneously, my attention would go often to the areas that you were suggesting. But it was completely spontaneous. It presented itself to me, like my breath or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But it wasn't by doing your instructions. It was by listening to your voice, just letting it come in, and then asking myself the question, what if it were easy? And just uh, allowing everything, allowing. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there because motivation is such a difficult task for me and rick last week talked about that very often people can't seem to get from zero to one in terms of awareness or practice that initial thing and so i just wanted to put that out to you um, um there are different phrases that will come to mind at different times but i think gratefulness and it's wide sense of the word is is a piece of it of awareness of just how supported i am anyway i wanted you to just throw that out to you and get any thoughts because this word cognition i mean it's a slightly different practice it's sort of contemplative or sacred phrase practice but the the place that thought can really have in a sort of marriage between that and the sensory Thanks, Peter. I mean, I think it's interesting to hear that there was a way in which you could relax into the practice and the phrase, what if it were easy, um, sometimes allows people to move beyond thought into a, a different way of relating to their experience. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I see Mickey Chen. Mickey, I'm going to unmute, unmute you, or you can ask Can you unmute yourself? Okay. Um, can bra brain cells, can they, re the brain cells don't increase, right? Uh, brain cells don't increase. 
connections but, between brain cells do? They can, but they they can rejuvenate. Um, I don't know that they can rejuvenate, but I think that they can become more tightly interconnected with other brain cells, which increases their efficiency. So if brain cells are dead, they're dead. Well, I think we start losing brain cells pretty quickly. Yeah, I'm just reading a book and they're talking about the brain, as you age, you lose brain cells. Yeah. But then they talk about um, new circuits. And so how do they... You're using new cells or? No, you're connecting the cells that you have to other cells in a more efficient way. So instead of having- A new a, pathway. With Yeah, you're creating new pathways between cells that are existing so that those cells can then be used more effectively. Um, okay. Yeah. And the other question was, in the book, they're talking about nucleus in the brain, but that's not the nucleus of the cell. I'm they talk about sure. nucleus of the brain and the and the um the neurons. Neurons. The neurons right. are brain cells, right? They are they are brain cells. It's a specific term for cells when they're in the brain, they're called neurons. So the nucleus in the brain cell is the DNA. Um, contains the DNA. I believe so. Yeah, I, I kind of confuse it. The book I'm reading is mm, 1997. So I'm I'm not sure what the, the right words are. Nucleus, when I talk about nucleus, I think of the biological nucleus as the center of the cell. Right. So he's talking about nucleus in the brain, but it cannot be the nucleus of a cell, if it's nucleus of the brain. No, maybe a center. Of a brain cell, I would think. Although I'm not sure. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, trying to keep up to date is kind of confusing. For sure. Thank you, Mickey. Thank uh, you. I saw um, Dana, please. Okay, I have a question. I've been a yeah. long time practicer and um, practitioner. <laughs> Uh -huh. My question is that, um, you know, I, I had some some trauma. I've had, a we all, like all of us, I've had a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. But I had uh, trauma, I'm 66. I had trauma in my early 50s with a certain person. And my brain will say that man's name all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how do I get that to stop? I mean, I'm not saying all the time, but, you know, a lot of the time. And, you know, kind of what it means is shame. Yeah. Um, and I, I just don't know how to get that to stop that kind of like compulsive, weird behavior. And I sort of think, oh my God, you know, when I'm got dementia, I'm going to be like talking about this guy nonstop just cause I, it was never, even with therapy and whatnot, I know it's not all, um, pro the trauma of that isn't processed, even though like maybe I didn't get over it, but I've gotten through it. I mean, I live yeah. my life. I'm fine. Yeah. So why does that? Why does my brain do that? And how can I get it to stop doing that? I mean, that's a huge question. I'm sorry <laughs> to hear that you're struggling with it. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know what to say other than, you know, the philosophy in a lot of practice is that you're not trying to stop things or start things. You're trying to swim along with things as they wash over you. So and it, it may be that there are, as you said, other emotional relate, re reactions to the trauma that are still in being processed connected to that person. And there may be other things to do to allow you to have a different relationship. I don't know what those are, but I just know that in, in, in a lot of the meditative work, trying to shut out thoughts or stop thoughts um, is not typical compared to trying to find a way of creating room for those thoughts and creating room for yourself alongside of them so mm -hmm. that you don't feel as erased when those moments do come up. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess just notice and accept and not no, fight. No, accept, accept is like a tough ask. <laughs> yeah. Accept is a tough ask. I wouldn't go to accept. In fact, you know, in our book, we don't we don't use the word. We stopped using the word accept. Interesting. 
you know, you know what we 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 changed it. We had chapter one of the one of the whole sessions was on acceptance and change and and like. We just changed it. And, and what we used instead was allowing and letting be. Mm, 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 so that mm-hmm. it's more of a process and mm. more of a flow. And then it's also up to you. How much of this do you want to allow? And how much do you want to let be? There may be some days when you're thinking, you know, I'm going to allow this and see where it goes. Mm-hmm. Maybe the other days when you say, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to allow this. And so we felt like that was a little bit more of a way of working with it rather than, well, I'm mm-hmm. just going to accept it because that's a huge ask. It, it, you know, it's weird because it's not like um, I have great pain over this person anymore or any of it. It just is just a blip in my brain that goes on. Um, but I guess it's, it, I guess you're right. If it, if it goes on, then there must be something I haven't processed, but um, thank you so that's much. So I will help people take up your time now. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, Dana. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Harry? I notice your hand is up. She uh, she may have left. Okay. I'm here. Oh, there she is. Okay. okay. Um, Hi. To have you uh, in our sangha talking, um, I've had um, 20 years of cognitive behavioral therapy. And before mm. that, I had um, rational emotive therapy with Dr. Ellis. Mm. It was kind of preceding cognitive. And yeah. uh, my dear therapist of 20 years is no longer um, available. And so I'm wondering if um, I need to continue with a cognitive person because I, I know that CBT is kind of a radical kind of thinking and therapy. It's not the usual you know, a developmental or um, eclectic kind of thing. It's pretty specific. Yeah. So I was wondering if you think um, I should try to find someone else or is there a way I could find someone like in California who does cognitive? Um, I have no idea whether you should or shouldn't. That's a big question. I know that there are some good cognitive therapists in California. Um, (laughs) Is there a way for me to find them? <laughs> Where do you live? Um, I live near San Francisco. Mm. Yeah, there is. There's a, I think there's a Jackie, Dr. Jackie Persons, P-E-R-S-O-N-S. Okay. Has a cognitive therapy center of San Francisco. I think she's based in maybe Oakland. Uh-huh. And she's a really, you know, she trained with Tim Beck and, and I think is really connected into that world. So either her center or she might know other people in, in San Francisco proper that, um, you know, would be a possible point of connection for you. Okay. And did you write a book or do you, or is there a book? I have the Harris book, but that's kind of old. <laughs> yeah. Is there a book? For, um, for the, the, the mindfulness, yeah. the mindfulness yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a book called the mindful way through depression, which is a book written for, um, just, uh, I guess it's a it's a book that describes the approach. Mm-hmm. It's a good it's a good read. Okay, thank you. Okay, Harry, thank you. Okay. Um, Susie G. Hi. Hello. Hello, Doctor Siegel. Hey, go ahead. Uh, my name's Marty. I'm I'm here with with Susie. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, um, I have some experience uh, with uh, my, my father, who was a, a manic depressive, and he's mm. passed, bless him. Um, he was on one of the original um, uh, uh, pioneers of lithium therapy back mm. um, uh, a while ago. And my, even after his lithium, um, he would go through these periodic manic depressive episodes. And I could see how cognitive therapy might be effective for, you know, the depressive side of it. But this manic side of it had such an incredible energy. It was almost like just so powerful. Is what Could cognitive therapy even pierce that radical, radical energy that is so almost unbelievably unreasonable, you know? Probably not. Yeah. Um, any therapy requires that there's an intact system of mind mm-hmm. to be able to perceive the, um, you know, the work that's at hand. 
Yeah. And if you're talking about hypomanic states, that's different than a full manic episode. Full manic episodes are actually sometimes considered to be quasi psychotic episodes. Yeah. Because of the, you know, the, the delusions and um, the way in which thinking is disordered. So if you have someone like that, it's very hard to, um, you know, have them sit one on one in front of a therapist and to think, you know, carefully about assumptions or beliefs or things like that. Yes. So, with many, with many um, folks, they need to be in some way stabilized first. Mm -hmm. And then after that, perhaps um, something that could be instituted on a psychological level. All right. Right. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much for taking my question. Oh, you're welcome, Marty. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Dr. Yeah. Siegel. Thank you. Holly H. Hi. Can't hear you, Holly. I think you're still muted. Do I need? Oh, go. thank you, host. I, I couldn't yeah, get yeah. unmuted. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Siegel. I very much appreciated that meditation. Um, my question for you was just um, a nuance of working with distress. And so to give you some context, um, a little ways back, I unfortunately lost a couple of loved ones uh, right after another in, in the same month. Sorry. And I'm uh, Yes, thank you. Um, and I'm a long term meditator, and I've been doing mostly the insight meditation. So really watching my processes. Mm -hmm. And during that time, in the aftermath of that, it was very challenging. And I spoke with one of my meditation teachers at the time, who suggested I switch to loving kindness, mm -hmm. which yeah. was appropriate. But since then, I've read and kind of played a, a little bit internally experimented, I guess, with kind of shifting the attention to the outer rim of that window of tolerance. And so I was just curious if you might have any, any things to try around that, because I anticipate in this human life, I will be dealing with grief in the future. And I'd love to be able to have some different ways of working with it. Uh, what do you mean by the outer rim of window of tolerance? Yeah, so just as an example, um, some of the teachers that I've worked with, they talk about, and, and this is for pain as well, to kind of just go close and to see what feels tolerable and like with physical yeah. pain to back yeah. off again. So yeah. you're kind of moving in and then creating more space for what's there. And I just... I was really appreciating some of the nuances of how you were leading us through. And it, it led me to wonder whether there might be some nuances you could suggest for that kind of inner process. Uh, I think that the, the, I think that it's something that we, I think worked a little bit on even here with sensations in the body. Um, I think the, f the starting point is first of all, to have a home base available to you. Because what you're really going to be doing is oscillating back and forth between investigations that may be difficult and not moving so far into them that you're overwhelmed. And also because you don't know what you might find, if you do get overwhelmed, giving yourself permission to fully come back to you know, the breath in the body or some other place of neutrality and safety. Yeah, like a and, body anchor point. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then and then the question is, you know, do you want to go back and kind of keep working that edge? Um, you know, like in yoga, where if you're engaging in a, a, a stretch or a posture and you're holding it and you can push a little bit more, there can be things to explore, but there's also the, the safety of not pushing into injury or anything like that. And so that's an analogy for how the mind can work with, with difficult emotional themes or um, other objects of attention that we want to investigate. I think that that's the general, the general approach in terms of you know, things that you might choose to look into a little bit more deeply. Great. Thank you so much. And I appreciate everybody's waiting. So I'll just ask you quickly, if I may, for somebody who'd like to do some professional studies in MBCT, would there be um, something you would recommend in terms of programs? I've seen a number of things yeah. out there. Um, there's a website, mbct.com. Okay. And there's a training pathway 
which is yes, okay. a way of kind of helping you get an experience of the program and then finding someone that you can get some supervision with or talk to to see if it's if it's something that you want to pursue. Great. Thank you very much again. Okay. Appreciate You're your welcome. time. Yeah, of course. Catherine, ready, ready to unmute and chat? Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, okay, so I have a question. It's partly for myself, but partly also because I, I don't I help try to help others with anxiety mm. a lot. Now, obviously, I meditate a lot, and meditation I know helps ward off a lot of anxiety attacks, but I'm I'm curious what you suggest is the the most current technique for when you're full on in panic, because I just don't know anybody who can start counting breaths or be mindful when they're in the throes of the actual panic attacks. I wonder what you'd suggest to help uh, people with, with that. Um, maybe give up the dream that meditation can solve all your problems. <laughs> um, I guess what I mean by that is that, you know, there are different strategies for different phases of panic disorder. Mm-hmm. And so for an anticipatory phase of panic disorder, where people may start to feel apprehension or building up of certain tension in the body, that meditative practices might be helpful there Mm -hmm. to to watch thoughts, to recognize sensations, to to focus in on tension and and to engage in in other activities um, to help address that. But if you're at the point where your body really has taken over and, and you're a sort of fight or flight, um, I think it's very important to generate sensations and to try to remain as present centered as possible. Sometimes the mind isn't the best route to do that. Sometimes, um, you know, generating physical sensations and staying present centered can be very helpful with a kind of a distress tolerance mentality. Because one of the problems in panic is that if you start to let your thoughts get away from you, then you're going to end up with a very scary catastrophic outcome, a heart attack, passing out, something really bad's going to happen. But if you can see it as, a, as an episode of a very intense physical bodily reaction that you can um, tolerate, even though it's unpleasant, mm-hmm. with generating sensations and ultimately with a kindness towards yourself that sees mm-hmm. this as a body um, really um, over firing, but with no real physical consequence for you, it might be able to uh, weather the storm that way. I think expecting meditation to do a job that it may not be that well suited for, I think, you know, can kind of backfire sometimes. Yeah, I read, I I saw a lot of stuff on um, the helping uh, relax or calm or do things for the vagus nerve during that. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Cold, cold water on your face, or even um, there's just all kinds of massage for the vagal nerve to help calm us. At least get yeah. us calm enough to start coaching yourself through back to mindfulness. If yeah. that, does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. It, it makes total sense. You know, sensation. Yeah. So it, it could be squeezing the hand rest of a chair, it could be pressing your feet on the floor. But if you could get cold water on your face, that's a sensation that's going to like get a lot of attention. But once again, it, it's more like you know, doing it from a place of care Mm -hmm. rather than from a place of, um, you know, urgency and and having to get out of this. It's like your body's, you know, going on red alert. It's going to take as long as it's going to take. Let me do some things to help me take care of myself and stay in this place rather than the place that my mind wants me to to go to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Catherine. Okay, Ali. All right, thank you, Dr. Siegel. Thanks for being here. Uh, I know in some modalities that your work is basically, I mean, mostly on the depression side, but the anxiety and depression are closely interrelated. I'm uh, wondering if one can use uh, uh, the depression modality that, you know, in your book, uh, some of those techniques into for anxiety. And then the second part of that question, if you could, is that if uh, <clears throat> I'm rushing during the daily activities, is that the sign of anxiety or is that like a feeding from anxiety underneath it? 
So thank you very much. So you're wondering if there were specifically different techniques for anxiety than for depression? Yes, that's first. Yes. Well, I think from the point of view of, of therapy, there, there, there definitely are. But from the point of view of mindfulness practice, not really. We could have introduced anxious thoughts or watching the movement of anxious thoughts in the mind exactly in the same way as we might have watched the movement of self-critical or judgmental or depressive thoughts in the mind. The, the mindfulness practice allows us to watch all thinking and not classify it as to whether it's depressive or anxious. And helping us develop this capacity to observe our thinking gives us a little bit more space when those kinds of thoughts show up um, and then give us a little bit more choice. And in the daily rushing activity without any uh, reason for it, uh, that is a, a good sign of anxiety. Am I correct on that? What, what, what's an example of a daily rushing activity? Well, I may be going to the kitchen really fast to... You know, just like I'm picking up probably a couple of things on the way there or something like that. I mean, it's like anxiety is underneath it that causes all that rushing without any reason to go from one place A to place B. You know, Ali, I would say I would say investigate that and see for yourself if when you next time catch yourself rushing, you feel like there's tension in your body or there are anxious thoughts in your mind. I mean, I've heard people say that uh, when they're rushing, they're not necessarily feeling anxious. They're just on automatic pilot. Like they're gotten, they've gotten really good at doing three or four things at once. And, and, and they feel like that's actually them being very efficient. So it's a valued state rather than something that's a bit aversive. I would just say investigate that and see if, if you're doing that. Are there thoughts about anxiety? Are there places of tension um, or high arousal in your body, or, you know, maybe there aren't any thoughts at all. Okay. Thanks. Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Glenda. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, my question is, what are your thoughts on EMDR therapy and its effectiveness and um, its use for anxiety and depression? And then the second part to that, there has been, a rise in these online at home tools that you can download and use and whether or not you view those as effective versus being um, being in the privacy of your own home, dealing with your own tolerance level, or mm -hmm. is it most effective or only effective in your opinion with a therapist? Glenda, you're going to get me into trouble. Why are you asking me these questions? Because I want to know. I know. <laughs> I want to know. Listen, what you, think. you know, uh, EMDR is controversial to some people, and it's like mother and apple pie to other people. Okay. So, so. I've seen, um, you know, I think EMDR, like a lot of therapies, is effective. And I think for some people in the psychological community, they can't really explain exactly why it's effective. And, and it's effective, but possibly not in the ways that the creators of the therapy have said it is. So that's, you know, rubbed some people the wrong way. But in terms of um, some of the feedback that I've heard, and I would say in specific contexts related to, to, to maybe treating traumatic memories, uh, I think the best evidence is for that. Across the board, I don't think so. But that's just my opinion for what it's worth. So um, from what I'm hearing, what I'm understanding is that there, in your opinion, is not a lot of validity to reintegrating um, <laughs> the person's traumatic experiences with uh, with the present tense or-, or No, 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 no. That's, it, it's super important to reintegrate. Okay. Super important. I mean, that's the work of trauma-focused therapy, reintegrating traumatic memories so that they're not separate, they're not um, isolated, and the person isn't living part of their life, you know, elsewhere. The question is, you know, the tapping or the eye movement or those kinds of things, are those effective ways of doing it? Or are there other effective ways involving, you know, somatic experiencing, involving, you know, the use of mindfulness practices? That's that's kind of one of the questions, but the, the basic principle that you articulate is 100% accurate. 
So do you think that it's more, and then I'll, I'll yield the floor here, but do you think it's um, more re-exposure versus the actual tools that they promote? Is it, is, do you think that that's the basis upon which it actually is effective? If I, if someone if asked it, me on yeah. an exam, yeah, I would say yes. My belief is that it works through exposure. Okay. It works right. through exposure. It works through re-exposure. And then there's some mechanism that allows that exposure, the products of that exposure to become more integrated into a narrative that okay. the person can have about their trauma experience. Okay. But thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Glenda. Hey, David. Hi, Dr. Siegel. Hey. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Good. I was out at Scarborough in 1970 when I graduated from U of T. Oh, no kidding. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. So um, I was quite intrigued um, by, by your mention of action. Yeah. And I, and I have a per personal with that because um, I you know, did have a manic episode uh, uh, when I was in graduate school. And uh, uh, I really haven't had mania since then. But um, and I'm intrigued by this action thing because. And, and and the sensation because if I'm in kind of a funky mood and I do go do something like wash the dishes or um, do some little carpentry project or or something like that, it 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 affects my mood. But it's got the sensation aspect to it, and it's also got sort of the satisfaction of seeing ha having a, like an immediate gratification from doing a a little job. So I, I, I'm quite intrigued with what you said about action meditation. I think once again, um, it's a great question. I think once again, what we're seeing is action involves sensory input. And if you can start to forage inside sensation, if you can start to explore inside sensation, then you're inhibiting in a very natural way, the tendency to think your way out of a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's an overlooked strategy. I think that the new somatic body focused therapies have been doing that for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I think that action allows the mind to be put into a neutral gear as opposed to always relying on our minds to help us understand our experience. It's like we park the mind, we go and do something. And if we're focused on that thing, it can provide us with a different place to stand on the problems that the mind is constantly presenting to us. Yeah, I, I heard, heard a, I think it was a woman about, I mean, it must have been 15 years ago, um, interviewed, and she was talking about um, the uh, increase in depression. And, and she, she, her theory was that, that, that we weren't doing the crafts, we weren't doing the little manual things like knitting or mending socks and all the, all these kind of things that were used to be part of our life. And we were basically in our heads so much that we should be doing more of these things. So that's sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, David. Thank you. Jesse, take one more question. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, thanks for the talk. I was wondering if, uh, if there's any study that has looked at um, the possibilities for patients that have been using uh, antidepressants for long periods of time and if after uh, using other kinds of treatments such as meditation or CBT, what, if there's any evidence that these people can Tapper off on the antidepressants, or what? What proportion of them are able to like stop using antidepressants and you know just use CBT or mindfulness as their their only treatment? Um, yeah, that's a great question, Jesse. And you know what? There has been a lot of research, but I'll, I'll have to say a couple of things about that research. I've I've done some of that research. Um, and a, a good colleague of mine, Willem Kuyken in, in Oxford, has done a lot of that research as well. So basically what the studies have found is that if you get people well, they've been depressed and you get them well, and you keep a group of people on an antidepressant that worked for them, and you take another group off and you give them mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, the degree of protection is about the same. Okay. 
Okay. So let's say for people who, who find themselves having to come off an antidepressant, like why would people need to come off an antidepressant? Well, antidepressants have side effects. Uh, sometimes antidepressants kind of lose their efficacy, something that's called tachyphylaxis. It works for a year, and in the second year, it doesn't work as well. Uh, maybe you're a mom, and you're, you're a, like a new expectant mother, and you don't know, want to be on an antidepressant in the first trimester of your pregnancy, something like that. So for people who need to come off an antidepressant, if they go into an MBCT class and they're able to practice and follow the the approach, then the protection is on par with what antidepressants can do in terms of protecting. So if 30% of people relapse on an antidepressant, about 30% will relapse in MBCT. But the discussion that way makes a lot of sense to me. The discussion the other way is like, hey, I'm on an antidepressant. If I take MBCT, can I come off my antidepressant? That's a much more complicated question. Because for some people, being on an antidepressant, if they've had one or two episodes, um, means one thing. If they've had multiple episodes of depression, it means another thing. If they have other um, uh, precipitating factors on whether they should stay on an antidepressant, um, it's not a straightforward situation. I think it really requires a discussion with, with your physician or psychiatrist to look at the reasons why you might be on an antidepressant for more than a year and to make a decision about whether coming off makes sense. But the evidence is that there are some other approaches that can be equally prophylactic. All right, thank you very much. Okay.